Okay, welcome to everyone who's joined the webinar today and thanks for taking the time to come and listen to what I hope will be a really interesting debate. So let me do a few housekeeping things before we start. So we're going to run for about 55 minutes and give you five minutes to avoid Zoom clash, which we're all getting very used to during this lockdown. Of course, during the webinar, you'll be able to see our speakers, but neither you nor our speakers will be able to see who else is attending. That's important for you to understand. If you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, you can do so via the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. If you've joined by phone or are experiencing any issues with that question and answer function, you can do so by emailing us at events at vrp.uk. So we'll select questions from the question and answer function and your emails during the webinar and at the end we'll, we'll go through those. Again, no one watching will be able to see your questions and will not announce who's asked them. And finally, today's session is being recorded and it will be shared internally within pay.uk and may be published externally also. Only the speakers will be recorded and your details, the details of the attendees and who asks any questions won't be visible. So that's the boring stuff out of the way. Let's get into the interesting debate. But before I do, I want to introduce the, the panel that we've got today um, of real experts, and I'm sure that they will make it an exciting debate. So first of all, Eddie, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks, Kate. Yeah, I'm Eddie Keel. I'm IBM um, leader for banking and financial markets in UK and Ireland. I also sit on the Pay.UK Participant Advisory Council, or PAC, as we call Thank you, Eddie. Now you're moving to Arun, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Arun Dharmaraja. I am head of European banking at WISE, which as sort of Monday has been WISE, we were previously known as TransferWISE. I do apologize if I get the two interchanged because <laughs> <laughs> old habits do die hard, but yes, as of Monday, I now represent WISE. Thank you. And I think that's a great name to have. It really pops. So over to Chris Henderson from Tesco Bank. Thanks, Kate. Yes, I'm Chris Henderson. I'm Head of Payments at Tesco Bank. Um, and also uh, I look after the Group Payment Strategy for Tesco Group. Um, and I sit on the UK Finance uh, Payments Board as well. Thanks, Kate. Finally, but not least, over to Becky Clements. Hi, yeah, I'm Becky Clements, I'm Director of Payments at UK Finance, um, and I also, like Eddie, sit on the Participants Advisory Council. Thanks, Kate. Super. Okay, before we get going, I'm going to cover a few messages and then we'll get into the debate with the panellists. So at Pay.UK, our PSO role in protecting payments flowing is key. But to ensure we remain relevant, we can't just do that. We have to look at other market movements. So being aware of the global payments market, technology advancement and changing consumer needs is key. We, we, we gather this information, we synthesize it and we risk assess it to make sure we're focusing on the right things. And this is key to making sure we remain relevant, and particularly as we're on our journey to the new payments architecture. So some of the trends that we monitor have accelerated over the last 12 months during the COVID pandemic. A good example of this is e-commerce transactions. Last year in 2020, over 30% of UK retail payments went through e-commerce, which is a significant growth. And we saw massive spikes in the use of contactless transactions. But I suppose a question that's important to understand is who's winning from these accelerated digital trends? As one example that I don't think anybody can argue with is Amazon. So Amazon marketplace growth has been boosted by lockdowns across the globe. And I don't know about you, but daily I hear the doorbell ring and I have an Amazon delivery. It seems to be somewhat of a habit. But their next move, predicted move, is into healthcare. So you can imagine a world where you see your doctor over a video call, which is already happening during COVID. And then an hour later, your doorbell rings and the Amazon driver delivers your medication. So this webinar, fast forward to 2030, is accompanied by the launch of our second white paper this year, 
the first one being on consumer protection. This is released today on our Knowledge Hub, and you'll find our Knowledge Hub at www.wrp.uk backslash innovation portal. And we'll give you more details of that as we go through so that you don't uh, miss out. So developed through desk research and interviews with payment ecosystem experts, we identified nine key strategic trends to, to look at. Three of those trends are set more near term, and that's what we've been really focusing on. And they will impact our work lives, our home lives, and hopefully one day when we're allowed out to play again, how we, how we actually spend our money um, from a recreational perspective. So let me touch on those themes first. The first one is virtualization. And virtual all around how advances in token and ledger technology are likely to lead to currencies becoming increasingly digital. In China, JD.com is the second biggest online retailer and recently became the first major online service to accept the digital yen. The second theme is atomization. And this is all around how payments are likely to continue to get smaller and more frequent and the new business models that this enables. We're already seeing this through subscription services such as Netflix and Uber drivers who are being paid by the ride rather than weekly or monthly. The potential significant increase in smaller, more frequent payments is a trend we need to monitor and understand carefully. And the last um, trend is internalization. And this is the concept of powerful commerce platforms offering consumers new ways to pay. A real life example of this is the DM um, on Facebook where it's planned to be the platform currency. And that fundamentally means that any purchases made on Facebook in the future would, would not use card or other payment rails. So they're the three kind of key trends that we really explore in the white paper. So the field work for the paper was conducted during 2019. And the impact of COVID-19 on the future payments market is not yet clear. And that's what we're here to discuss today and try and bring out uh, what the, the panelists think. So let me move on to our panelists and let me turn to Eddie first. In your role on our Payments Advisory Council, you had a chance to input into the white paper. But in light of everything that's happened, particularly in the last year, do you think our findings still hold true? Everything in the last year. <laughs> yes, um, good question. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I mean, the pandemic has seen uh, heroes and, and villains across the whole financial services space. Uh, fortunately, I think we've had more heroes than villains, but um, but the, the good guys have done some amazing things, including regulators as well as banks and financial services people. Uh, and the bad guys are always there. But but the those three trends, I think, are still the right three three trends. I think they're still um, they're still topical, they're still correct. Um, the, possibly the easiest order in which to validate them is not the order that you, um, you went through, but I think um, um, the atomization thing is clear to everybody and, and that's okay. definitely gonna happen. That's the sort of unstoppable force. We need to improve a lot of experiences. We need to make things much less frictionful and so on. Um, and we need some consumer protections about it so that we know we're in control when we're making payments. Um, and that's the theme that I'd, I'd like to pick up on later. But um, the second one for me, uh, in terms of easy, easy to answer, is internalization. And are we all going to be living in a Facebook world? Or a, um, um, and that's the big threat. You know, if Amazon could actually provide all of everything, that would be very difficult. So this is a real trend. Um, personal experience last week when I sponsored somebody's friend on a uh, to run 100 miles in February was uh, to be to be sent a message with a link to a just giving website that took me to a pay by bank app that belonged to American Express that took me to um, my Monzo card, um, which was on my phone and then returned me all the way back down the food chain. It felt pretty clunky. And if we're gonna compete with the people that can internalize everything, we need to make those journeys much better. Um, and then the third trend about virtualization, um, you know, really getting into blockchain and tokenization and so on. Yeah, it's here to stay for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we need, again, some regulatory drag on it just to make sure we are safe and secure and doing what we are, what's best for society. But the three trends totally support them still. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. 
And turning to Chris, so from a retail banking side, are you seeing any of these trends and choices that your customers are making? And how are their priorities maybe changed? Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a good question. I think Eddie's points are, are well made. Um, Look, I guess in terms of the way customers are, are paying, you've already touched on some of this, Kate. Um, contact us over the last year was an example that, that's increased um, dramatically. Uh, in fact, it was increasing in the last few years, but what I guess COVID has done is accelerated that um, trend, as, as you might expect, which fits into the kind of this, this the trend of kind of atomization. Um, and we're seeing customers who, um, you know, uh, have not used wallets before, some customers who have not actually shopped online before um, are now moving into, into that space um, and getting more comfortable with that. And I think that's the big thing for me here is that, um, you know, there were a number of trends that were already already happening, um, but what COVID has done is, is kind of accelerated that. So we're seeing that customers are now more comfortable in paying in, in not, not only new ways, and for some of us, it might not seem new because contactless has been around for a while, but for those customers each time, that is a, that's a new way to, to pay, but also in different ways to pay as well. Um, that, uh, so, and I think that's really the big thing for me. So I would say, agree with the three trends. I think the one that's probably most relevant over the last year for me has been the optimization. I think that's Thanks, amazing. Chris. And I wanted to, uh, maybe shouldn't admit this because I work in payments, but a good example is my husband used contactless for the first time in lockdown. He used to refuse to use it. It was the devil's work as far as he was concerned. But anyway, now he loves it. Of course he does, because it's great. Uh, anyway, turning to Becky, we worked with your team and a wide group of participants on the Payments Futures project last year, which was a really exciting project. And you produced a paper and published it earlier this year. It'd be good to explain a bit about how these pieces of work complement each other. Um, I think they um, sort of sit side by side each other very nicely. Um, I think the piece of work we did was more, um, perhaps more practical rather than market scanning. Yours is more yeah. is sort of wider than the um, specific work we did. But I think the, the main thing that came out of the work and is the collaboration that we've got, you know, across the industry. And that's something I think, you know, working together with you even on this is great collaboration. So I think, you know, that's one thing COVID has done and the pandemic has made us work much better together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd certainly agree with that. Okay, and moving to Arun, and um, I was going to say transfer wise, but I should really say wise now. Obviously, we're all going to have to get used to this change. Um, you're very much an international business, and how much of your, what we're seeing is UK focused, or is it wider? What, what would you say? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Certainly, a lot of these trends are probably even more developed outside of the UK. I was speaking to a colleague from China, for example, and he mentioned that he hadn't seen a banknote for over three years um, living locally because everything he does is inside the Alipay or WeChat Pay app. So he can not only send and receive money, but he can book a doctor's appointment, order a taxi, pay for his groceries. And that's something that probably frightens a lot of regulators and central banks because it essentially means that the economy is visible to one large corporation or one or two large corporations. And that's certainly something that, that needs regulating. But when I look at the UK and I look at how these trends have developed, a lot of it develops due to gaps in the existing market. And actually in the UK, we've been quite good at addressing these gaps. So Faster Payments, when it launched in 2008, was actually quite ahead of its time. It was one of the first 24-7 instant payment systems. And it means that new entrants when they come in, they don't actually need to fix the problem of sending money from domestically within the UK. So for example, Wise fixed or tries to fix the problem of sending money abroad, other participants and entrants have fixed the banking problem and so on. However, when you look abroad, that, that problem hasn't been solved by the payment system or the payment bodies. In the US, in Europe, it certainly still takes sometimes days to send money domestically. So those markets are still quite ripe for disruption. And I think the worry here is that, well, if an Amazon or Google fixes the problem of payments in the US, it becomes a lot easier for them to then move that to the UK and other markets. So it's important that the UK and other bodies stay ahead of the game. And I think with MPA and various other things, it's, it's a testament to Pay UK that 
you know, future thinking about the future is always on the agenda. And I think that's really good. Yeah, that's a, re a really good point there. We have to consider the threat of, of the large corporations as well. OK, great. So we move on now to talk about the impact of COVID-19, which is obviously significant. So it's clear the three trends we focus on are only part of a very complex picture. The three most important of the nine key drivers that we identified. <clears throat> and the picture has been complicated further by COVID-19. Sadly, that ongoing crisis continues to affect lives and livelihoods across the UK and internationally, and it will do for probably decades going forward. We need to face into that. However, times like these can often spur innovation. And we saw um, the deployment of confirmation of pay, which is a, a tool to help against fraud uh, during the pandemic. Um, and UK Finance was very heavily involved in the very quick increase in the contact list limit from £30 to £45, and it looks like that might be increasing further going forward. So thinking about COVID and, and how it's impacting, if I could turn to Becky and ask, um, we've discussed before how the retail banking sector had to react quickly to COVID-19, but what challenges and opportunities are you seeing emerging from that? Um, as I said, mentioned before, I think better co collaboration from that. I think the way we worked with Pay.UK and you leading actually on, on the um, uh, furlough payments, um, I, you know, that was excellent collaboration with everybody sharing their data and, and which hadn't been done before. So that was a first. And I think we need to continue to work at pace and collaboratively because I think, you know, with some of the fraud stuff that's happening, um, if we were sharing more, I think yeah. we'd catch more bad guys. But that's one of the things I would really like to see um, happening throughout this year. Yeah, and it's certainly, it's, there's a fraud work stream coming out of the payment futures work that UK Finance are leading. Um, and it's something, again, that's really important. The more data you've got, the more you can, as you say, find the bad guys. Something that we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to. And that's something yeah. we need to build into the MPA as well. So Chris, how are payment service providers taking these ideas forward and, and making new customer propositions? Um, so maybe just before touching on that, I think the point about collaboration that um, both you know Eddie and Becky have made is, is a really good one. I think that was something that's come out of um, that cross-industry collaboration last year was, was excellent. And you know, being able to do things at pace that we wouldn't have probably thought we could do only 12 months prior to that. So I did very much echo that that point. Um, look, from a Tesco perspective, uh, we uh, serve a, we got full, the full community of customers. So from our perspective, the response had to span everything from digital gift cards through to cash delivery services to customers. And, you know, as a way to try and help customers during the, during the, the lockdown. Um, but I think actually just across the whole industry, there were some great examples of innovation, as you've said, you know, things like companion cards that were um, were launched in a very short space of time as well. I think for me that the interesting part is not just about the innovations that will come on the back of it, but the pace at which everybody was able to, to move. And I think what will be really interesting is the impact on new ways of working. So you don't realise you can do things as quickly as you can until you actually have to do them as you, as you have to. Um, so I'd be interested to see if, you know, um, I, the kind of ideation to delivery um, actually now becomes shorter. So again, not something that I think is new because we knew that was, you know, was something that was happening anyway, but it's again, something that I think um, COVID has, has done is accelerated that trend to, to move from an idea into innovation and delivery very, very quickly. So I think that's something that we'll, we'll see more of is kind of more rapid, more rapid innovation as a result of COVID as well. So. Um, so yeah, we've seen we've seen quite a quite a few responses, but I think that the interesting bit for me is the it's, it's how the industry has actually come together mm -hmm. and delivered things collectively, um, with some great some great examples of, of innovation across the piece. Okay, yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Chris, and it's something we must make sure we don't drop and, and forget that we were able to collaborate and, and move at pace definitely. So the last question I've got in this section is to Arun and, and Eddie, and it's all about, you know, our white paper contains many terms and predictions that, are, that people understand, things like the Internet of Things as an example. 
But is there a chance that due to COVID-19, we could see entirely different payment ideas emerging? So if we go to Eddie first. Um, well, let me give you a slightly more earthy answer to that than and, and all this wonderful collaboration and so on. I, you know, I think one of the big lessons that's come out of COVID is um, you know, society appears to be slightly more tolerant of, of some of the um, those that struggle to keep up with the technology. Um, and, and that's good. That's part of the, the hero thing. Um, and I think what we need um, in terms of new things coming out or what we'll see as new things coming out of the COVID experience is, is stuff to support those that would otherwise be left behind. And, and by that, I mean the sort of check and reassure type of function. Did I really make that payment? Did it really go through? Was I sure confirmation of pay, for example? I mean, one of the greatest things we had was the ability to turn, and it didn't come from COVID, it was around before, but the ability mm. to turn off your card. Yeah. And because you think you might have left it on the bus and you didn't, mm. but you just, and that, that really helps people get comfortable with technology. And, and frankly, you know, checking and reassuring is only just about putting a bit, making a bit more data available to a few more people. So um, I think we'll see a lot more innovation in that. And it will be aimed squarely at those, as I say, but otherwise be left behind and would be perhaps not quite where your husband is, Kate, but um, it would be resistant, shall we say. And I think that's an important, an important step change. So technology for everyone rather than just the, um, the geeks amongst us. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And Aaron, over to you. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with what Eddie said that, so I think there's two main things for us that we've seen. One is, you know, cash usage was always something that had been declining previously, but I don't think anyone predicted that one big issue with cash is that everyone would see it as a unhygienic payment method. Um, mm. And now all of a sudden it's got this issue where potentially it could be, or at least it was initially seen as a vector for potentially passing on um, a virus. Um, We've seen that if you look at the remittance space, traditionally there are a number of high street cash money service bureaus that only accepted cash. And for a lot of people sending money abroad was done going to the high street, taking a lot of cash. And we've seen not just in the remittance space, a shift to digital. But the interesting thing with COVID is that, as Eddie said, it went from having a choice from doing something face-to-face -face or digital to everything being digital. And what that meant was that there were a lot of services that said, well, if you were stuck, you could go to the branch or call someone up or go and see someone face to face. And those options were no longer available. So a lot of organizations, including, including WISE, we've had to look at the entire process to say, well, what if um, you know, someone can't come in or someone can't leave their house or someone can't send a document through? What does that actually mean? And um, you know, now everything is digital. It, it's meant that kind of we're pushing down everyone down this digital path and then inclusion for people who are less technologically savvy, people who have had this dependency on cash is now you know, mandatory because everything is just so digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we mustn't forget the wide spectrum of customers that we serve, um, most definitely. So if we move on to talk about immediate impact on trends and end users, which we're starting to touch on anyway, um, we talk about trends, when we talk about trends, we're talking relatively long term. And the 2030 study was designed to stretch our thinking and allow us to bring to life the potential future of payments. It's, it's obviously not all going to come true. Um, it's like a back to the future movie. You can make, uh, you know, you can make assumptions, but we'll, we'll see where we get to. So as we develop the new payments architecture, it's really key that we understand future trends and, the, and design its capability to, to to support those market needs as we go ahead. However, the, the market doesn't stand still. And in the meantime, we're already seeing a wealth of activity, particularly in the business to business payments market in all of these emerging spaces. And that kind of begs the question, how can we harness innovation to enhance our existing propositions and benefit customers now, rather than waiting, for example, for the new payments architecture? So Arun, from your perspective, where are we seeing the drivers having an impact already with WISE and your business? Yeah, I think if you look at Faster Payments, for example, when Faster Payments first launched, I think there were about 12 or 13 participants back in 2008, and now there are over 30. So this access to payment systems and access to the banking system, the traditional banking system is very important because if 
faster payments continues to adopt this relatively open access policy as well as direct access there are a number of new access methods that have been pioneered as well it improves the the accessibility and it, what it means it goes back to my point earlier that no one really needs to disrupt the the way money moves in the uk because access is relatively easy of course there needs to be some controls and safeguards and it can't be a completely open door policy but by having open access and you know a relatively open mind to new things that's really where i think payments can go and you know structure themselves to really be future proof so yes mpa is good and when mpa comes that will be it's important that, that continues to be interoperable and future proof as well but i don't think it like there are a lot of core cool trends identified in that report i think the the big message though is that no one really knows what's going to happen in the next five years let alone 10 years and it's important not to bet on one thing happening rather than the other and keeping an open mind at this stage especially with all the disruption going on with the pandemic no one no one really knows so i think it's just really important to keep the options open and build build standards that are interoperable and scalable yeah. for anything yeah and that, that's a real really key point you don't want to back yourself into a cul-de-sac, most definitely. <clears throat> so Chris, and I used to work with Chris and Tesla Bank, so I, I understand exactly how their model works. Um, when we talk about virtualization, I often think, you know, people think, oh, this is a new thing. Um, well, it's not that new, but it's within the last kind of five to 10 years. But if you think back to uh, the way that Tesco Club Card was launched, would you see that Club Card is an example of a virtual currency that is, is well used in the UK. Um, I think it's a really it's a really interesting um, a really interesting question. Um, I can see the parallels, so I can see the parallels to be drawn between um, a virtual currency and um, a rewards program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a shared there's a shared value exchange um, between loyalty and, and reward, um, and, there, and that reward. Can be used in some cases, you know, in and out of of, um, of Tesco, for example, um, and it's linked to, you know, it's linked to the the payment. So I, I can definitely see the parallels. Um, honestly, I think at the moment, um, if you were to ask a customer um, or you know somebody on the on the street whether they saw uh, virtual currencies and whether they would have even heard of any, maybe beyond the likes of Bitcoin, I, I suspect I suspect not. So it's probably quite a, a you know a conceptual leap to go from thinking of um, uh, something like a rewards program for that to be considered um, a, a virtual currency. But as I say, I can see that I can absolutely see the parallels and those are very much about the, you know, the, the, the link to payment, uh, the, the value exchange. But I, I would have to say uh, I, it's, it's quite a conceptual leap at this, this point and uh, probably not one, it's not the way I would think about um, uh, club card but it's a really interesting perspective yeah i suppose the, the point is if you develop a killer use case like club card and um, to exchange value people don't need to know that it's a virtual currency or whatever they just need to know how it works and that's i suppose where um i think when we're in the payments world we get all you know really geeky about <laughs> understanding the what goes under the bonnet, et cetera. From a consumer perspective, they need to know that they can make a payment that is easy and generally that is safe. Um, so that's what I was trying to pull out there from mm. a club card perspective. Um, and then Eddie, I know your, your role primarily for focuses on financial markets. And what learnings do you think the retail banking sector can take from the market that you, that you function in? Um. So I think the, the the bit that I love about financial markets is I can do quite unknowingly I can do amazing things without really um, much activity and there's a huge and rich um, rich as in it's functionally rich rather than populated with rich people but there's a huge ecosystem of people that are very skilled at all the piece parts of it and I can make all of those wheels turn quite easily so so if um, if I change my pension plan, no, my, my retirement plan, I decide I'm going to go 10 years earlier or 10 years later. Like that. You know, in, in theory, that, that triggers a reaction through the fund manager, which might end up by going to an instruction to a broker. The broker will probably execute some sort of trade. The trade will need to be cleared, settled. There will be some change to the custodian arrangements that sit behind that. 
that would in turn find its way back up the food chain back to me so I get a different valuation and a different and all those, and, and all of those things are, are highly specialized quite complex skills um, that the city executes sub second day you know with algorithmic trading and so on day in day out 365 days a year 24 hours a day and and that's just amazing and and, and it, in theory it's all covered by um, you know, one set of uh, one set of regulations, one MIFID directive, and I know we're outside of um, of the eurozone now, now, but um, but most of the MIFID things will still apply. So you've just got this this wonderfully rich marketplace that that is full of things that I can trust. I'm not saying they great value. I'm not saying they're uncompetitive or they are competitive, but it just has got some some the most amazing ecosystem of, of very very complex things that I. Most people have got no idea what happens when they do things like that, when they move their money into an ISA or out of an ISA and they, and they create some sort of change. And, and so the challenge, I think, is, is not to stand in awe of the city and say, well, it's a different place. It's all very large amounts of money and it's all got to be specialised. But to say, well, what can we pick from that in a retail world? What can we do for people? Because we do have similar steps. I mean, my example of going to a the, the Just Giving website, which has now got some different payment options, that, that triggered about eight or nine events. And I, mm. I know I didn't have to respond to an email message telling me I'd got something inside of LinkedIn and LinkedIn took me to just, I didn't have to have all those steps in it. And if I'd done it all from one device, it would have been easier. But, but the real world is there's lots and lots of different parts that could be made to move together. So I think, yeah, financial markets and uh, just look at the richness that's there and the specialization and so long as you get the interfaces right, then everybody can, can, can play. Yeah, and I think that, that point on interfaces and making the consumer journey as slick as possible is really important. It, or people if you will define, use it if it's difficult. Yeah. yeah, if you define the interfaces before you do anything, so you give everybody a chance to come and build things up to it or provide services up to it. It's not just a technical interface. And, and that's, what, that's why London is London. That's why London is the best place in the world to do those sorts of things. Okay, thanks Eddie. And then turning to Becky, um, we talked about the Payment Futures Report earlier and it focuses on how the industry can best facilitate innovation. What do you feel are the next steps we need to take towards enabling a better future for consumers? So I think there's, there's a lot of work being done on consumer protection um, and that was sort of pulled out in the, um, in the paper, Payments Futures paper. Um, but I think at the moment there's several groups all looking at it and working with pay.uk actually we're looking to pull together maybe a steering group which has mm -hmm. the group, so it'd be the pay.uk UK finance working group the OBIE um, PSR working group and the consultation of all sit underneath it but then there's a sort of a lozenge on, along the top so everybody's connected so I think that's probably mm -hmm. the next step in our consumer protection um, journey um, I think it's going to be quite a long journey and I think there's going to be lots of different um, methods of, of either stopping it or, um, you know, redressing it. The other piece of work that we're doing with Pay.UK is looking at the faster payment message of today before the MPA. And is there any possibility that we could put a code word in there so that the receiving bank could see that it was for a purchase, you know, and it's going to a you know, 16 year old boy. It might ring some bells and the same with like an investment scam. Could you put something in there so the receiving bank knows that the person who's sending it thinks it's an investment. So that's ongoing work and I think they've even got a session on it today. Um, so I think we just have to keep just chipping away again against that con consumer protection. I think that's going to be big this year and lots of folk on it from everybody. Yeah, and I think the collaboration element of that is key um, because again, we need something that works across the market and that um, you know, it's easy to use and, and, and spots and stops um, fraud and, and retail problems as well for consumers. And it's got to be easy for consumers to understand. It can't yeah. be too complex. Okay. So um, the last uh, question I want to throw out to the panel um, for debate it's really all around uh, if you could make a prediction for 2030 and if you could if, if it related to one of the drivers that we've talked about what is going to be the most important and why it doesn't have to be your prediction it is good enough but if we could go around the panel so if I go to Chris first of all please 
Yeah, sure. Um, prediction. Uh, I think Aaron already made the point that um, you know, five years out, ten years out, it's it's hard enough to, to know what's going to happen next year sometimes. But like, I think I think for me, the atomization piece is is one where I expect that to continue. Uh, I think in particular, you know, there's a generation today who have uh, you know are basically native and custom to using certain new ways to pay, and and, then, and as they mature, I think into kind of the, the various next life stages, I think they'll drive that adoption even even further. So, you know, trends like the use of smaller payments, um, I think will continue to increase. Um, I think though, whatever whatever happens, so the most important thing will be that customers still um, want and need a, a choice as to how they how they pay. So that that's probably the the, the kind of the overarching caveat that I would I would, I would add to that. So so I think optimization is the one I would I would back here. Okay, thanks, Chris. And Andy, what do you think? Um, so I'm I'm going for internalisation. I think that's the that's the big thing that will bother us in uh, by 2030. Um, but let me put a slightly different perspective on it. When, um, when IBM is not looking, I do quite a lot of rugby, and one of the things I do is I run a rugby club. Now that's not that's not a big deal, um, but it takes up a piece of time. I have about. 10 different accounts that I use to do that. I do direct debits, direct credits. I have iZettle, I have SumUp, I have a card net machine. Um, we do cash, if you can remember what that stuff is. And we also get quite a lot of checks in. And I, I'm a payment specialist. I know my way around this stuff. And I just don't have the time to integrate and rationalize and sort out all of those things. They're all from different people. They're all on different contracts. I think we have five or six different current accounts that the club is run by so that different people can have different access and different views. And if the internalization, um, and if I could live in one world and somebody could, and it was Amazon and they could provide all of my needs and, and feed all of the things that I need to do, pay the, uh, pay the groundsman, pay the bills, um, buy the beer, uh, collect the subs, sell the international, you know, that would be heaven for me without me thinking, I'm, actually, I'm not even price sensitive about it. It would just be so much easier. And so yeah. there isn't much chance given uh, the, the history to date of, of, well, let's say banks have struggled to fulfill that set of problems for small, medium enterprise people. Um, and it's not, it's not because it's a rugby club. Florists want to be florists. Florists don't want to mm -hmm. be experts in the banking system and when they should be using one payment type over another. Um, and when they should move to something like iZettle or, or SumUp or, or should they be using Stripe to embed something into their webs? They don't want to do all that stuff. They haven't got time and they haven't got the skills and they haven't got the interest. So the first the first one that can internalize that set of um, uh, requirements and, and provide it as a single stop, um, maybe it's Tesco, who knows? Um, there, there's, a, there's a big win there for somebody. And I think we'll yeah. see that. Definitely, it's that convenience play, isn't it? People don't mind playing a bit of a premium for convenience. Not, not if you're running a bit, as I say, if you're trying to be a florist and yeah. buy flowers and sell bouquets, then why would you be remotely interested in trying to um, to go through your card net statement and, and itemise, you know, just, you haven't got the time for it, any. Okay, thanks, Eddie. Words of yeah. wisdom there. <laughs> frustration, Becky... frustration, <laughs> if you can feel it, Kate, yes. Becky, what would your prediction be? Um, that you can pay at point of sale by using an interbank transfer rather than using a card scheme. That would be my, um, that would be what I would really like to see by 2030. But by the 21st of June, I'd like to go out to dinner. So that's my first <laughs> prediction. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think we all share that one. <laughs> and it will happen, hopefully. Okay, thank you. And I agree with you that that choice of payment type, both at point of sale and on e-com, is, is really important um, going forward. And so, Arun, from a wise perspective, what would be your wise prediction? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that was a pun or not, but if so, well, well done. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, first of all, I definitely agree with um, everything everyone else has said, and I'd also love to go out for dinner very soon. Um, <laughs> But I think for me, like digital currencies and virtual currencies are all very cool and I could speak forever about those as well. But the optimization thing for me, from a society point of view, is actually really interesting. Like we're still in the UK primarily based on this model of you work today, you potentially get paid by backs, which takes three days, potentially a month or two months later, which from a financial inclusion point of view is the people who are financially struggling, that's 
a model that I don't think works very well because it means you potentially dip into your overdraft because you're waiting four or five weeks to get paid. It means you are deferring on bills, you accessing credit that you probably don't want to access, which is potentially quite expensive. But we have all the infrastructure now with faster payments to pay people within hours or minutes of the work mm -hmm. being done. And like Kate, you mentioned earlier on, Uber are paying drivers very frequently. Mm -hmm. But why can't the rest of the world move to a model where you work today, you're paid tomorrow? Um, mm -hmm. And it, it has such a huge impact on individual cash flow, but then also the ability for individuals to then spend that money. And when we're looking at a post-COVID world, which has been... Mm -hmm you know, decimated by, you know, unemployment, job losses, et cetera. Anything that can help ease personal finance concerns, I think should be acted upon faster. And I don't think anyone's really talking about it. And I'd love it if we could. Okay. That was, that was really interesting. So those, all of those predictions are, um, are really insightful. Um, and let's see, should we put a bet on to see who, who wins? We can we can go with the June the 21st one. I think that's that's near term, definitely. So thanks for that. Um, and I suppose the webinars serve to highlight that this is, you know, the payments market is really complex. There's so much change going on and trying to figure out where you place your bets is a continual um, a continual problem that everyone in the payments market looks at from you know the trade bodies like Becky's area, from our area, from a central uh, payment system operator, from Eddie's as a, a, um, a supplier of um, technology and, and Chris as a retail payments function around this, um, you know, moving money internationally. I think we're all looking at these problems through slightly different lenses but with the same uh, challenges. So no one understand, no one organisation can understand the whole picture and that's why collaboration is key. And that's the thing at the end of this webinar that we really want to get going is we want to start a conversation about the impacts of COVID. And we want to get all of your expertise into that conversation. Everyone who's listening to this webinar and others, if you encourage them to join. So we'll let you know how you do that after we've gone through a few questions that have come through on the, the question and answer session. So let me start with the first question. And this is for Chris and Aaron, so I'll go to Chris first. Um, there's a distinct possibility that CBDCs, so central bank digital currencies, are, could be used for um, GBP, retail transactions, and international payment traffic in the future. What are the thoughts on how the UK retail systems could cater, these, cater for these once NPA is in place? So Chris, first of all. Um. It's an, it's an interesting, uh, very good um, good question. I think for me, with any new way to pay or any um, new initiative, um, you've got to start with the customer. There's got to be some kind of compelling reason why uh, that would be um, it would it'd be better than what we have we have today. Uh, to be honest, in terms of it's maybe one, I'll say for Kate uh, to answer on you know things like the NPA and how that would would enable. Um, but I think for me the key would be. There's a lot of considerations, such as, as we know today, regulation that sits around it, insurance safe and secure for customers, but ensuring that the technology works. You know, Eddie's made the, the point that the uh, the ecosystem, the payments ecosystem, has a number of different um, entities and um, partners throughout it. So it's not about one, you know, one individual um, area being ready for it, such as retailers. It's got to be actually um, how, as a as an ecosystem. Are we, you know, would we be ready to, to handle that? And, and I mean that in its biggest sense, including things like regulation, the customers, the uh, the merchants, and, and any of the, the the other entities involved in that um, uh, in that ecosystem. So I think it's got some really exciting possibilities. Um, you know, no getting away from the fact there is already a lot on in in payments yeah. today. Um, so I think it's got many exciting possibilities. But at the minute, for me, it's probably still further out in the, in the horizon uh, right now. Yeah. And Arun, from an international perspective. Yeah, it's, I mean, how, how long have you got? But it's, uh, it's a really complex question. Um, as Chris said, it, it's quite far out. But I think you need to, like, there are a number of design considerations with a central bank digital currency, which central banks all over the world are trying to figure out. I've seen one approach which says, which says, you know, we want it to be like cash, which where the focus is actually like anonymized transactions. 
Um, mm -hmm. But then you have a huge number of concerns with financial crime and regulation, which no one's really figured out. And that's when you look at it from a domestic context. When you start mixing in two different regulatory standards usually involved in a cross-border transaction, you double the complexity. Um, but you know, some of the design considerations of a digital currency do involve intermediaries. And it's, it's possible that you could design it in a way where you have Pay UK or another central body potentially supporting the underlying infrastructure of a digital currency. But again, when you have for the cross-border aspect, you then need that to happen twice for it to happen on both ends of a transaction. Um, so yeah, long story short, I don't really know is my honest answer. Um, it's super exciting and I'm following it very closely. The Bank of England have put some good stuff out. The ECB have put some good stuff out. China is moving forward with it. I think they announced this morning that they're trialing cross-border payments with like Thailand and a number of other markets. So certainly the innovation seems to be in that space. How it will translate to the UK and other cross-border transactions, uh, I'm watching the space as much as everyone else is. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it seems to be gathering momentum um, very much so. Okay, the next question is for Becky, and this is about how closely is the industry working with the Bank of England as a regulator on the rise of digital currencies and other trends? So I, I personally think it's early days yet. Um, yeah. A lot of different, there's probably about three or three different digital currencies that you could look at. You know, there's cryptocurrency, there's virtual currency, and there's central bank digital currency. Um, you know, I think people are familiar with things like Bitcoin, but there is actually quite a lot more out there. And I think it will not um, take off until it's properly regulated. Um, I think people need to feel comfortable that what they're dealing in is, is safe and it's not, you know, money laundering or anything like that. So, yeah, my, my thing would be early days. I mean, I think it started back in about 1983 with a company called um, Digicash, um, but that mm. went bankrupt in 1998. So... I think we've just got a lot more work to do on that to, to make everyone sort of feel comfortable and the man in the street understand what it actually means. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's definitely key. And um, lots of questions on digital currency definitely coming through, but let me ask a, a different question. So how can new types of payments really distinguish themselves from established models um, if they have a business case or valid proposition, particularly for merchants? I think that's a question that can maybe go to Eddie and then Chris on. So how can new types of payments distinguish themselves? Yeah. Um, so part of the answer, part of me screaming, it, it's about the merchant stupid because it, 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 to me, they, they often get overlooked in this food chain. I know we want to make a nice desirable experience for, um, for consumers and we can all go out with, but if you haven't got anywhere to spend them and nobody wants to take them, it's really quite pointless. So, so I think um, uh, you, you can't distinguish yourself. Well, you can distinguish yourself by being easy to accept everywhere. That would be a nice change. So you, you know, it doesn't have to be a separate terminal or a separate acquiring device or a separate set of technologies um, or even a limited set of retailers or places in which you can spend these things. And then, and then I think the, um, from a consumer perspective, it, it's just about how easy the whole transaction piece is. You know, you, we've got to get away from from logging in and secure customer authentication and all these anything that, that introduces friction needs to be made frictionless. I'm sorry, I don't I don't mean get rid of the process of checking no. you out, but but you've got to make that so it really is transparent, um, but not to the point um, uh, where you you fund you kind of worry that you might accidentally make transactions or, or make transactions where you don't know. What you've done so so all these innovations around um you know, your phone goes ping every time you do something brilliant love it and can you check your balance without having to kind of go through a long process to see what can i see my last all that sort of thing will differentiate people so it begins to look and feel uh, like a wallet like cash you can go and check what's in there um and then so yes if it's if it's accepted and acceptable everywhere it's easy to use um and i guess the only other thing is you've really got to trust it you've really got to trust yeah. that it's going to be there tomorrow and that that kind of kills some things i mean even people collecting we talked about value and um and loyalty points and so on there must be people with air miles really worried about whether there's going to be airlines to, to go redeem them and that's plus big chunks of change for some people 
So, so yes, long-term trust in the um, in the currency, and all of those arguments that Becky made, or the comments Becky made about, you know, uh, CBDCs and, and virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies and so on. Yeah. You know, how happy are you feeling today if, you, if your all of your pension was in one of those? Mm. Pretty pretty good if it was Bitcoin, apart from the last few days. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I guess <laughs> one last um, comment from you as a, as part of a merchant. I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I think it was a really, um, I don't want to cop out and say I really liked Eddie's answer, but uh, I really <laughs> liked Eddie's answer. Um, and the, um, the, the reason I like that is, well, first and foremost for me, it's about um, the customer. So any, anything that you want to do has to start there and it's got to be compelling. And the reason it's com it would be compelling um, is it's safe and secure and there's trust. So to Eddie's point, it's got to be trusted. Um, that you know that's always top of the pile when it comes to when you ask a customer what you want from a payment it's it's got to be safe and secure and um, I think the point about merchant acceptance is really really important as well it's got to be ubiquitous um, and the, the point about friction is exactly right it, um, you know if, if you can clearly an element of friction is is important this is my point about uh, safety and security but it's about making sure that the customer you know, it's a, it's a slick process for that customer to be able to use that, that payment. Um, and it's and very, very importantly, it's got to solve a problem. I think that's, that's important. Um, and it's got to solve a problem for the customer, um, not necessarily just solve a, uh, uh, solve a problem for the, the, um, the, you know, the merchant as well. It, it's, got to, it's got to really be compelling for the customer, I think is my answer. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And if I'm going to stick to my promise of, of finishing at... Uh, Five two. I need to get a move on. So I think it's clear from the debate. There's there's lots of change happening. There's lots of questions that have come in. We can answer those on email if you want. But if you really want to get involved in the industry debate, and um, if you join our industry challenge, that would be great because that's where we're gathering in everybody's thoughts. We'll synthesise it. We'll share it back, and we'll we'll make a, a hypothesis based on that information. So how do you do that? Um, as I said before, um, you can do that by visiting www.wrp.uk backslash innovation portal. But we'll also send everyone who attended this um, webinar an email with those details in it afterwards to say thank you for your attendance. So please join in. It's really important that um, we get your views. We are you know, in the centre of the payments ecosystem, but we need the expertise from the payments ecosystem to help us move forward. And I want to say thank you so much to the wonderful um, panel members today. It's been a really interesting debate and lots of different perspectives on similar problems. So thanks again, and uh, I'll let you go to your next Zoom call or maybe some lunch would be nice. <laughs>